Ventures, which is uh, in Boston, and we are a research advisory and consulting business that focuses on higher ed and the businesses that serve higher, higher ed. And it really is a, uh, a great pleasure to uh, be able to introduce this group that we have here. Um, they are quite accomplished in, in what they've done in various sectors of higher ed media, publishing, and technology. So with all the disruption that's taking place in uh, higher ed and the content, I think that this will hopefully be a very beneficial session. And what we'd like to do, we're going to run through a number of uh, questions here, and then we'd like to leave some time at the end for, uh, for your questions, most importantly. All right, so uh, I'd like to introduce the group that we have here. First, uh, here we have Ariel Diaz, who's the co-founder and CEO of Boundless Education. Uh, Boundless is uh, an educational content provider, a very, very new one and innovative one. Ariel is an entrepreneur with uh, an impressive engineering background that's complemented with a wide variety of startup experience. Secondly, we have uh, Bill Hughes, who's the Vice President of Business Development and Innovation for Pearson Learning Solutions. Bill's a software executive uh, focused on internet-based ventures, innovation, and product management. He's experienced in a full range of new ventures, product development, and user-centered design. Dan Silverberg, who's the Senior Vice President of Marketing for Cengage Learning here in Boston. Dan has over 17 years of strategic, strategic marketing leadership experience across both information technology companies as well as educational media and publishing. And uh, lastly, Dr. Nish Sonwalker, who is the founder and managing director of Synaptic Global Learning and co-chairman at EdTech Circle at the EdTech Circle of MIT Enterprise Forum. Dr. Sonwalker is regarded as a leading expert in the application of computers in education. He has extensive research and development experience in hypermedia authoring, mobile learning, and adaptive learning. And he's currently involved uh, in several MOOCs uh, right now that are, have been starting up over the last uh, several, several months, I believe. Okay. Well, as I mentioned uh, at the start, higher education continues to face a great deal of disruption uh, in all areas across the academy. Um, we all feel that and we all interact with that in some, some way. And this panel is particularly focused on the rapidly changing world of educational content. And content has traditionally and will, will traditionally, I believe, shouldn't be injecting my own views, but I think it will continue to fuel and augment uh, second post-secondary learning across a broad range of environments. That would be the traditional, of course, blended and purely online. Um, you know, it's interesting. I remember when uh, I'm old enough to remember, and I think maybe a couple of panelists are old enough to remember in 1995 when Bill Gates came out with his book, The Road Ahead. Uh, and he completely forgot to mention the internet. Probably didn't forget. He didn't see it as being a necessary thing. Three months later, he had to add 20,000 words, revise the entire text, and relaunch the book, of course, adding in the internet. And it was that second version that everybody that I knew in the publishing industry said, this is amazing. Textbooks will not exist in five years. And here we are, uh, close to 20 years later, and uh, textbooks still, in fact, exist. But there are lots of uh, alternative alternative ways of learning and teaching. So we're here to discuss those today. Um, so I'll just jump right to the first question. It, guys, experience, uh, empirically speaking, what do we know about what's actually working in terms of content delivery and learning management systems in higher ed today? There's an awful lot of talk and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of engagement, but what do we really know from a data-driven perspective about what's working in the classroom? Ariel, would you like to start? Uh, can everybody hear me? Great. Well, be in and out of the classroom, I think we know pretty well what is working, and it's, as you mentioned, the Internet. So if I were to ask, uh, you know, who was the president of Turkey in 1917, you wouldn't open a book to try and find out. You would whip out your smartphone and type it into Google and try and find out who was the president of Turkey in 1917. Uh, and that's what's working. And the, the amazing opportunity we have now 
is to leverage the power of the internet in and out of the classroom to bring education to more people, again, both in the classroom in terms of making that more effective, free, open, remixable, and all the, the, the tenets of the internet, and also expanding the, the quote classroom in terms of the MOOC opportunity and what that can do, and deliver education to more people than I've ever had access to this before, because we have this amazing opportunity and we have this obligation to spread this education through this educational content, through the technology and the internet that we have today. And uh, if you were still trying to look at the answer earlier in a book, you probably wouldn't have found out. And it turns out that in 1917, Turkey was uh, the Ottoman Empire. So it's kind of a trick question. And they didn't have a president. They had a, a sultan. Uh, so that's the future of and the present of educational content distribution is the internet. Bill? Great. Hi, Bill Hughes. Um, this is a, a great topic. Thanks for facilitating it, John. Um, I, I think to, to uh, maybe expand um, Ariel's picture, I, I do agree that there's, uh, you know, things like Google and search have been a, a huge boon in terms of discovery and so forth. Um, but if we kind of think um, more broadly about the different modalities of education, um, I would put, you know, if you think about a two by two where the columns, uh, one column is, I think, Ariel's column of self directed learning. And then there's another column, and since Pearson's instructional or Pearson and Cengage, we'll have the instructor driven learning here. That's, that's one dimension. And then I think there's another dimension, which is is it foundational learning or is it exploratory learning? And if you have an instructional foundational learning, that's like developmental math. And that's uh, um, you know th things that, that are fairly clear to understand can be can be delivered in a in a fairly straightforward pathway. There's uh, there's some other things though that, that start getting to Ariel's world uh, of discoverable, but they, they really have to do with instructor led um, exploratory learning, and the tools there are kind of um, a mishmash right now. Maybe what what we're doing, I think Cengage may be doing some of this um, uh, of uh, custom publishing, which allows the curation, the auto-curation of, of content and pulling, pulling that together from the instructor viewpoint as opposed to having that um, forced off the shelf. Um, and then there's, you know, in the self-directed, some of this stuff is test prep of just, you know, I need, to, I need to learn this now. And MOOCs are a very interesting way of thinking about some of the foundational um, self-directed learning, where people are now able to to on their own find what they want to learn, go through a, a structured program, and learn something, and even get a certificate at the end. And then I think the the, the that other quadrant is really um, kind of an open, very curious place, and it is the place where um, where students live most of the time. Is this very self-directed learning piece? The the challenge is that um, while there's a lot of value uh, in the experience. There's not clarity about value. How do you capture value there to make it a market, and hence drive investment in that in that area? And I think the MOOCs are one example. They're trying trying to figure that out. I think Ariel and his business is trying to figure that out. We even are trying to figure that out. But uh, in addition to to all the great things that are going on, I think we have to really think about what are the economic models that will sustain those things longer term to get a sense in terms of not just where it is where it's going. And uh, we'll get back to, to some of the, the um, uh, to get back to, to, to one aspect of your question, though, uh, uh, we have, um, we've seen a big move in, um, in, in the market. The largest move we've seen is in our um, offerings that, that do have measurable results and outcomes. And those tend to be things where we take homework and automate them and throw the textbook away. Um, my math lab is probably the iconic version of that. And if anyone, if you if you Google my my math lab, you'll see efficacy study after efficacy study about cutting in half um, failure rates in classes and things like that. That's a and that that really gets to the foundational kind of learning. Um, so we've seen some success there, but these other areas, uh, you know, I think the success is to still uh, to be determined. So following on um, Bill's comments and, and to the uh, point of the question, I think it's, empiric it's, it's empirically important to prove effective outcomes. And I think we're all working towards that. And there's a variety of, of ways to do that. 
tying that data back to the content so that you can prove efficacy around the content that instructors are using and purveyors of content are putting out there. And so as a uh, content purveyor, we do tie a lot of time to learning analytics so that, as Bill mentioned, we can show the efficacy of that content either granularly as it pertains to specific learning objects, holistically as it pertains to the use of those learning objects at an institutional level, a course level, perhaps a department level. So I know we and, and everyone in this room spend an awful lot of time working towards the goal of outcomes and, and really ensuring that students are successful. And the web has really afforded us the opportunity to do that because we can evaluate the effectiveness of individual pieces of content to um, ensure success of our consumers, and, and that for all of us at this conference, our students. The, the thing that I find most interesting is the connection between engagement and success or outcomes, and really being able to focus energies through things like conjoint analysis, et cetera, to really hone in on the things that engage students, which then the direct correlation to outcomes is undeniable. And, and it, it really allows all of us to get away from some of the things that just frankly aren't helpful to students and allows us all to really focus in on, you know, content, quality content, delivery of that content, and then really being able to show instructors, institutions, governments, accreditation bodies, et cetera, the, the benefit of the educational content and, and delivery that, that we're providing. So, I think the answer to your question, is there empirical evidence and, and how is that used to determine the value of content? I'd say we're in the infancy of being able to do that, but absolutely yes. And as big data moves into the education space and analytics become more robust and sophisticated, we're all gonna be able to help students achieve better outcomes by, by analyzing the, the distinct content units. Great, thanks, Dan. Nish? Uh, I come from a uh, slightly different perspective, primarily because I've taught courses in classroom and use a learning management system. Uh, the first thing which I had major problem with learning management system, that they had nothing to do with learning. And that was the comment I had to make when I was uh, one of the uh, 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 person judging all the learning management system, which came out at the end of the tail end of the dot-com bubble. So there were lots of large companies, Blackboard, WebCT, you name it, uh, Docent, Saba, some of these are old names. And uh, what we found is that, yes, you can put the content on this learning management system, but it was all one size fits all. And then uh, my question to all these companies as a judge used, uh, was, what about pedagogy? What about the learning models? And they said, not my problem. I said, how come? You are learning <coughs> management system, and you have nothing to do with learning. I said, no, it's all teacher's job to do the teaching. So they essentially took this whole enterprise resource management software and put it over the teachers to figure out how to teach. And guess what happened after that? And I think uh, Sengage and uh, Pearson Booth is represented here with all due apologies. A lot of cartridges were created and what teachers did, upload the cartridge. So what happened, it was almost becoming mechanization of the teaching process. And this is where if you look at the PowerPoint-based models, every teacher hiding behind the PowerPoint, which were all created by the publishers, not created by the teachers themselves. And I'm not saying it's essentially wrong thing to do, but what happened there, that the creative aspect of teaching in the classroom became highly mechanized. And I think it became one size fits all. So I think learning managements essentially have not worked for the content arena. And essentially what they have done is over-dependency on the cartridges, over-dependency on the, all the content which is created by the publishers, essentially for teachers to do their job. And if you look at, most of the publishers will target teachers because they are going to adopt the book. So what happens is that there's absolutely no understanding or thinking about what about the learner's end. So learners have to struggle with the same problem because one size fits all. So I would say uh, for the last 10 years or so, we have done that over and over again. And if you look at the completion rates on online education programs, it's very dismal. If you ask University of Phoenix online, what's your completion rate? 
It's very dismal, and they will probably not disclose it. So I would say that the reason is one size fits all has not worked. In classroom, good teachers will personalize, as we talked about. So now there is a movement. The good news is that all the publishers represented here as well, my friends, they are now moving towards adaptive learning. They are moving towards individualized, personalized learning from the student perspective. And I think that's where we are at the crossroads here when we talk about massively open online course and looking at the content. By the way, most of it is in the Creative Commons, so it's given out free. So now there is a lot of struggle between publishing world which want to hold on to the content. This is how they make money. And then when the content goes into Creative Commons licensing on a MOOC, then who, how do you make money from that? So I think I'll just stop my comment here because we have a lot of other questions to answer. But I'll say we are at the crossroad now where we are going to look towards individualized adaptive systems, which is the world I come from. And also in the MOOCs, we are going to look at adaptive MOOCs where the content will not be one size fits all. It will be rendered dynamically as the student is going through the learning trajectory. And I think that will be, I would say, a sea change or a, a quantum leap in terms of educational systems. Thank you, Nish. Um, that's a very good point about how the MOOCs are obviously clearly changing the education world. Everybody at the table, I'm sure, is, has been thinking about how they will engage with content to extend the business model into MOOCs successfully. As uh, Anant said uh, earlier today, the numbers of people that are coming into uh, an introductory circuits course at, uh, through edX are 150,000, which is massive. So if you're not able to sell a traditional content chunk, whatever that may be, to an individual student, the economies of scale may be just as beneficial. So I guess from the variety of perspectives here, Ariel, uh, going to you first, how do you see uh, providing content to the MOOCs in a way that's, that's economically viable and as a way that's beneficial for the individual learner? So I wanted to highlight a couple of things that Nish said. Uh, one is the content is already free. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. All of this content for introductory level college material is already freely available under Creative Commons licenses under public domain content, which the government releases all of their research and work in. And the challenge isn't how do you keep charging for content? That's last century's model. The challenge is how do you innovate on the business model and create a business model that does two things. Number one, the content's free, so you have to deliver value and capture value on what you're delivering. And number two, puts the learners first. Uh, the students are, at the end of the day, are the ones trying to acquire this knowledge, in many cases going to severe debt to acquire this knowledge, and we need to focus on the students to put them first and figure out what's the type of personalized adaptive learning that we can make uh, to help make students' lives better, to help make students' learning more effective. That's the real critical thing. So from a content standpoint and from a MOOC standpoint, all of these are tremendous opportunities, but the business model starts with how do you measure your delivering value to students, and then how do you capture that? Because again, the, the genie's out of the bottle from a content standpoint, so there's a lot of challenges to create really innovative business models in you know, this new world. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I love you, Ariel, but uh, <laughs> the genie's out of the bottle um, with content is a little like saying that um, all motion pictures are free because of YouTube. All right, I think there's a spectrum of services, and I do think that uh, as somebody who, who started two open source software companies, I understand the importance of, the, of, uh, of open source as a licensing model to drive innovation. And, uh, and I applaud you in, in, in seeking to, to, uh, to figure that out. Um, there's a few things uh, that you said also. I do believe um, business model innovation is really important. And what we figured out uh, at Pearson is it's about service. And service is about delivering results and outcomes and what's the, the ultimate goal. If our goal is to help you um, have content in your hand for chapter one, that's a pretty low bar goal. And as Seth showed in the last talk, you get very little bit of the value of the trillion dollars that's being spent in education for doing that. Um, you get a bit more value um, if you're really helping to, to deliver um, results, results in terms of learning, demonstrated 
outcomes. And I do think that there's a, a, a big portion of that that the MOOCs um, are, are, are working through and struggling with. You know, I think on one hand, you've got um, uh, some MOOCs who are really just uh, catalogs of online videos. Um, on the other hand, you have some MOOCs who are really trying to create uh, technologies and frameworks and uses of data that uh, are going to drive to an understanding of what's working. Um, and, uh, and you can build models, I think, around, around that, but the models will probably be service. You know, we call it learning as a service, education as a service. And I think the third, um, uh, the third element of that is personalization. Um, putting students first, I do think, is really, really important part. I, I did, Nish, want to say um, that you brought up a lot of valid points on, on learning management systems, and we probably should talk about that. Um, uh, we've probably not done a very good job in marketing to you what the kinds of things that exist right now um, that go w well beyond what you ha were describing as current state. And actually, I think it, it's important to understand what exists now so that we don't reinvent the wheel as an industry. For example, um, for the last five years, the number one higher ed product that's been selling is one that's personalized learning and, and about a year ago was relaunched um, as with an adaptive model. And, and what we learned about that was um, if you give students time to learn whenever they can, 24 seven, and you give them feedback that's not tied to them sitting in front of a possibly intimidating professor, then they learn a lot better. And if, and if you're giving them real-time feedback in terms of where they are, I call it kind of a GPS for learning, then you, you, we all know what the effect of having a, a cell phone is and having a GPS and the comfort we have and knowing where we are at any point in time. Well, learners have never had that. And Bill Gates just announced yesterday in, in his le open letter um, as part of, part of the Gates Foundation annual report um, how important um, it is going to be to, to build learning experiences where information and learning is, is intrinsic to that, and that feedback is given back to, to the user and to the educator in real time, so it can change behavior. Um, and those are the things that, that we already know are true. There are examples of where, they, where they're happening. Um, and I think we need to, to do more of those things. I think MOOCs are gonna serve an important role in informing um, uh, the state of the art in that regard. And we see it as a great um, experimentation bed, among other things. Yeah, I think I shared that view. The ends in MOOCs are particularly high, so the sample size really allows you to uh, be able to adapt very quickly and to be able to really focus in on what we discussed before, and that is what are the kinds of things that really drive student outcomes? And, and you know, small pilots historically have not been able to do that from a statistically significant uh, point of view, and I think MOOCs present an opportunity to allow us to do that. In terms of how we're able to um, drive good content through a MOOC environment, you know, Cengage partners very closely with the first uh, keynote speaker at X and a variety of other folks, and really I would argue that we are all in the experimental phase and we're all figuring out what kinds of content and delivery, I, I can't remember which keynote said there's the I and the T, and one is the information and one is the technology, and where those two things cross is a very interesting intersection, because it's, it, it isn't just about, say, words on a screen or video on a screen, but it really is about um, how that information gets transformed to a learner. And if, if ever you have done any sort of uh, um, ethnographic research on how that happens, you see the various modalities of learning and you see that, that a, a MOOC does provide one format for doing that, but as it evolves and as adaptive learning and personalized learning come into play, I think it's going to be very interesting to see those data sets come through to understand, you know, there are probably, what, four or five personas of learners, and, and to really understand how the intersection of content and the technology benefits those various learner types. So I, I, I don't think that there's 
one size fits all as a very good answer. Frankly speaking, I don't think we've ever thought that one size fits all is a very good answer, but instructors in a linear learning path find it very difficult to teach to high end and low end. And so as instructors, as institutions, as content purveyors, even self-directed learning, it becomes a very interesting model when you try to put wide banks of content out in front of a relatively large audience. And to me, I keep going back to the data, that is the most important point. I mean, the beauty of this whole thing, and I was talking to John earlier, I've been in education forever, and it's never been this interesting of a conversation because it was all so linear, and now it's also not. And so to be able to really see what can be adapted in terms of content and delivery is a very exciting time, and I think we're all, you know, we're all in the infancy of figuring that out. Well, as you know, uh, MOOC is a different animal, if I should say. <laughs> and also, this is a word now becoming very popular, so now people are MOOCing their courses. So I think, how many of you are ready to MOOC your course? I don't know. But I, as we move forward, I think we are going to do that. Two things which I observe in MOOCs very different. One is over-dependence on the videos, and I think some of you mentioned that. But if you look at what is turning out in terms of content in MOOC, is the star faculty, which is being recorded. So you're talking about Anand Agrawal teaching the circuit course. I, I guess you cannot find better person than him in terms of the MIT domain. So if you look at that, uh, then if you record that, and these are high value production uh, events. So if you look at MOOC, it will cost you anywhere from 100 to 150,000 or even more. So if you look at now the for-profit angle, which is Coursera and Udacity, they are funded by Kleiner Perkins and all the major venture capital. They can put enormous amount of uh, video and production value to it. The other side of the video is gamification. So you look at the dependency on the video with the star faculty, and other side gamification so student can learn through various games. And if you look at the book, I just saw the book related to that content as a subsidiary or secondary element. They had put that as a resource, and in fact, some of the publishers provided that book for free. And what happened to that book is that the, the hard copy sales went up. So I think what we are looking at, there are secondary effects, but the model is changing completely with the high production value. So when we are recording MOOCs in, uh, in a public university, University of Massachusetts at Boston, whatever the lecture is given converted into the text. And that text and graphics, whatever is presented, is becoming the main content. So if you look at that content is being generated as the MOOCs are being created. And I would say that the books are being sidelined in some ways, the textbook, but at the same time they come back because they are being referred in the MOOC sense. So I think what we are looking at is, again, the crossroad, and we are looking at this whole idea about data-driven analytics and so when there is a game-based learning part with the lectures, that's where you are getting the analytics. So now you know which content is working, which content is not working, what are the areas where difficulties are happening. But one of my issues with the MOOCs is that they are still following the one-size-fits-all model. And I think that will not go too far because you saw in the statistics in Anand's presentation, there were 5% completion rate. If you look, if you want to take a MOOC which is available throughout the world, uh, the worldwide MOOC, if you call it, WWM instead of WWW, then what we see in WWM is that we have to have adaptive system so that at least we can go to 20, 25% completion, and that will translate into thousands of more students worldwide. Right. So I think while the MOOCs are democratizing the educational system by providing very high quality teaching at, at no cost to the end users, but there are a lot of peripheral services, which I think our friends from various for-profit world is going to start creating around that pre-MOOC, and then the MOOC are going to elevate the level of education because it will be highly production-oriented environment with the best teacher, what you can find, and that's where I'm calling about star faculty model. So you will see that Walter Lewins, who is a star physics faculty, is teaching again. They brought him back from his retirement to teach a MOOC in the electrical engineering side. I think this is where you will see it's not only how much you know about the content, but how well you present. So it's about talent management for the MOOCs. So we are living in a slightly different world now. So I will stop my comment here and say content will play an important role, but it will come 
a lot from the domain experts, and the rest will follow the domain experts' presentations in the MOOC world. Great. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, one more question. We'd like to leave some time for, for your questions. Um, but you talked about uh, adaptive and you talked about outcomes. And uh, outcomes is one of the themes, uh, student outcomes is one of the themes of this conference, obviously. And we have a six-year national post-secondary graduation rate on average of 50 percent. Some cases, some states are lower than that 50 percent, obviously. The, the real, um, where, the, where the rubber hits the road, to coin a phrase, is how do we improve outcomes? And we've talked about learning analytics. We've talked about, uh, we touched on briefly adaptive technology. But when you, when you think about providing content and platforms, which all of you are involved with in some ways, what, what, are, the, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges of implementing adaptive learning? How does content, or how do content providers or system providers, in your case, Ariel, how, how, how do you enhance the, the process of mobile, um, personalized learning, and adaptive learning? And what is involved with that, and what are your challenges? Uh, so you touched on a few points there. <clears throat> Before even getting to adaptive, you have to get the content into the hands of these students. And at community colleges, which represent a large chunk of the college students in the US, a lot of times textbooks can be just as expensive uh, as the tuition, and plenty of studies show that you know, somewhere between 50 and 70% of students have foregone purchasing a textbook for financial reasons. So clearly, if you look at graduation rates and outcomes, it's very difficult when you're at a disadvantage from the start uh, because you don't have the content that's being referenced in the course. So I think before you can even use and leverage the power of adaptive and personalized learning, you have to make sure you can get the content into the hands of every single student and that's where I believe the power of the internet to, to give freely available open content to these students is step one. You know, we should not have any percentage of students that are at a disadvantage simply because they don't have access to that content. And then beyond that, once you have access to this content, that's where you can really start to get into the interesting opportunities of adaptive learning and personalized learning. Uh, and we are in a mobile first world, you know, where, uh, you know, of, of our students uh, who are, you know, coming back and, and loving Boundless as an experience, many of them uh, would have dropped out had they not found Boundless to save money on their textbooks. Uh, you know, they're using their smartphones and their tablets to access this device. So step one is getting the content into the hands of as many people as possible. And then once you get that usage and then you can start building, as, as uh, Bill mentioned, you know, increasing that the N, right? Increasing the number of people, being able to run experiments on what types of adaptive learning paths are really the most effective ones. Getting this into the hands so when they're waiting in line for 10 minutes, you know, they can whip out their smartphone and study for those 10 minutes, whether it's some flashcards that they need to review to catch up, prepare for a test in a few days, or just catch up on the, the core reading that they may have been assigned. So I think there's really that two-step process, and I think, we, I think it's uh, unfair to students to, to, to forget about that, the fact that there's a content gap uh, in this country right now, especially for the most disadvantaged students. Um, let me take a different um, perspective and kind of anchor my, my response in um, the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, you know, the, the other statistic that, uh, uh, that I think about, John, is 82% um, of kids who start in ninth grade don't graduate with um, any type of post-secondary degree on time, or on time might be even three years for an associate's or six years for a bachelor's. And that's a, that's a big, a big problem, and it's a, there's a failure in the in the process, uh, the system, uh, from a process standpoint. Um, and I don't think that content per se or access to content um, is what's the, what's causing that. Um, and I and I but I, and I do think that. Um, a different process, a learning process, and enabling a kind of a re-engineered learning process, which really does mean the interplay of content and systems, is is what changes that. So if I look at something like, um, you know, Google, uh, and and the power of Google uh, for for kids, it's the ability for students, it's the ability to ask the world a question <laughs> and get an answer immediately. That's really important. Why is that important? It's because the learning process, um, there's, there's the, 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 not 
the, the time when you learn are the aha moments where you're stuck. And your, your brain asks a question when you're stuck. And you have to get over that moment of being stuck. And when you do, that's where revelation happens. That's where learning happens. So let's ask ourselves, how, does that ha you know, how can that be enabled? For example, by, by content and, and, and technology, I think, combined. You know, one way is, is search. And I can ask, ask a computer a question and give me an answer. Another way is um, through personalization, where computer says, um, seems like you know this, but you don't know that. Um, we've got a lot of systems. In fact, a president of Alleyoop, which is a, a, a startup that was um, generated by Pearson, is here, um, Patrick Supons. And uh, he's got a whole kind of game-oriented math and science um, uh, progression that is personalized and allows a kid to, in a kind of a game-like way, to know what they know about algebra or trig or biology or general science and they can go along their own pathway. But it's, it's at that moment, what do you know now? Where do you need to go now? And, and by, by computers being able to, to help people navigate through content, which is what teachers do well as well, uh, but we need to, to kind of help teachers and take a lot of the kind of routine aspects of guiding people through learning and, and, and content experience, take that off of their plate so they can really focus on things like motivation and so forth. And when you do that, um, the, you're, we're taking uh, an important part of the teaching process and outsourcing it to technology. And when you do that, it's got to have a level of quality, measurable effectiveness. If you go to a doctor, and the doctor says, I'm going to give you a pill, which is some software, to make you better. That pill better not fail. That pill may, better have gone through all the different stages of validation and testing to make sure that it works. And we haven't been doing that historically in education around content. I think that's, that's one of the next major things that's going to happen. Well, I think, uh, I think in terms of how adaptive learning can be applied in an effective way. I think we've hit on some good points, and it really does go back to sort of personalized learning experiences and how to engage the learner. And, and it is, in my estimation, a combination of whatever you call the teacher or the leader or the sage on the stage or whatever, you know, whatever that person or thing is and the learner and their ability to intake that content. And, and I think there's a level of flexibility along learning paths, and any good instructional designer will tell you, you know, that, that, that that's the case, that, that there isn't just one learning path, and you do need to be able to adapt the content. And so we, Cengage, take that very seriously, and in fact have really transformed sort of all of our thinking around content and content delivery around that mechanism and around the idea of engaging students through the use of personalized learning experiences. And, and we're trying to articulate that through something called MindTap and a variety of services around that. And, and what we're finding is, is that it really is not only about the student, but it is also about the instructor directing that learning process. And, and to your point, I think one of the beauties of the technologies that are available today is that you can now do that at scale. In my child's second grade class with 24 students, the instructor, the teacher, is not actually able to do that one-to-one. -one. But through the use of web-based technologies, ed edX or any other MOOC is able to actually do that at scale. And so, you know, I think we, Cengage Learning, are really focused on that. And the results have been unbelievable because you really are affecting outcomes of students while doing it in a very responsible way because you're involving those that are closest to the student and those that are working with the student to affect that outcome. And, and that's the instructor. And so being able to you know, provide a context by which personalized learning experiences can occur, it's, it's proven to be very effective thus far. Though, as I've said a hundred times just on this panel, I, I do feel like we're all in the infancy uh, of, these, of these ideas. 
Thank you. Uh, this is my favorite subject, and I've spent over 15 years doing adaptive learning system as uh, my research at MIT as principal educational architect and director of Hypermedia Lab. So I think I'm going to take a little bit of time to just dispel some of the myths about what we call adaptive learning. Adaptive learning word has become fashionable. Everyone wants to use that word in a various different ways. And if you look at it, it has now become an abused term. Because if you just provide auditory, visual, kinesthetic information, you can start calling yourself adaptive. In some cases, we have also seen if you have a table of content that changes based on what your pretest has, you call it adaptive. If you provide some kind of tutoring behind it, you start calling yourself adaptive. So I'm going to first dispel the myth is that in a truly adaptive system have to have four components. Number one, you have to have a pedagogical framework. It can't be just tutoring. You say, okay, you've got this question, I'm going to give you this answer, which is sometimes called adaptive. And in the pedagogical framework, you have to understand cognitive psychology of the learners. So you're talking about learners who are apprentice learner, incidental learner, inductive learner, deductive learner, and discovery learner. So I do not want to go into a lot of details, but suffice to say that some students learn best with step by step. If you give them step by step, and I've observed that in my teaching, I'll teach them for one and a half hour, 90 minute lecture, and if I go to their book and I'll see four steps they wrote down. So if I had given them those four steps at the beginning of the lecture, they would be very happy. Other ones who say incidental, they want to connect with what is called uh, storytelling. They want case study. Harvard Business School, based on all case study model, which is incidental learning. If you look at discovery, uh, in inductive learning model based on example, a lot of people in algebra and, uh, and differential calculus, they say, give me an example, how you solve it. And so these are example-based learners, and it transfers everywhere. If you look at deductive, they are the learners who say, I want to learn by doing. So give me a project-based model. And at Aero Estro Department of MIT, that was done in almost in every course, they found it had very positive impact. If you look at the robotic competition, which is nothing but deductive learning model, where they do the project-based learning with a small kid. And finally, discovery-based learning, where now we are talking about learning environments. We are talking about simulation. We are talking about real simulation where you can be almost like second life kinds. You can be in the system. You can be prodding and probing some of the buttons. And you understand by discovering on yourself. Sometimes it's also called inquiry-based learning. So if you look at you have to have that pedagogical framework so you can take the content and create all this learning pathways or learning strategies. Because at the end of the day, it's not style, but it is the strategy. That's another problem comes. Everyone say, I have learning styles. And learning styles are a highly abused word as well, because anything can be called learning style. If you wear different kinds of clothes, that's your different learning style. So what I would say here is that let's focus on learning strategy. So if I, if I am given a particular, let's say, learning task, what is strategy that I'm going to use? And what we found in our research, not only students learn differently, but they learn different content differently. So you can't uh, take a Myers-Briggs test and say you are going to be this kind of learner all throughout your life. What we found when you go from history, learning history, to learning calculus, you may be completely different learning strategy. And I think that's where a truly adaptive system have to have a learning framework and also learning pathway, which we call learning strategies. And then you have to do real-time learner analytics. So you have to be able to see every click stream that student has done, understand what is working, what is not working, and then provide them real-time intelligent feedback, saying that you tried this model, this doesn't work, let me put you to another model. So you iterate them through different learning strategies, collecting that statistics, and by the way, MOOC has so much statistics, as you guys said, that you can do convergence to their statistics very quickly. So now you can converge to that statistic quickly, and now you can provide a dynamically rendered content which never existed before, and that provides you the right way of learning with their truly adaptive system. And I think that's where I see an unprecedented opportunity because teacher is a domain expert. And if I teach this class with, let's say, 100 people here, I cannot accommodate 100 learning strategies. So I would let computer do that task for every individual student looking at their intelligent trajectory. So if you look at, if you use some of the high sophisticated statistical models like hidden Markovian statistics, you can almost observe what student is doing, create certain probability structure and say what learning strategy may be working best for them. 
once you get that now you are able to say that where is the content that i can provide which will get that student to the highest learning outcome and that's where content elements become very very important but they cannot be one size fits all they have to be in a truly adaptive system where you have a pedagogical framework learning strategy then you have a statistical analysis of the student and the real time feedback so if you talk about adaptive system and someone says these four elements do not uh, are not present then i'll say it's a pseudo adaptive system well this is not bad because you are right. going towards a realistic adaptive system and that's where what i've been uh, uh, saying a lot here is that let's go to a truly adaptive system where a student uh, modeling is done in real time and then you can change the content also in real time and then we can take the nuggets that most of the publishers have spent millions of dollar creating the best content and right. then <clears throat> put it in the framework that works best for individual students. Thank you, Dr. Sonwar. I just do want to leave a couple minutes for, for sure. questions, but Go thank ahead. you. Thank you very thank much. You. I'm sure you could talk all afternoon. All day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we would like to uh, leave a few minutes for questions. I see somebody has their hand raised in the back. If you'd like to direct a question to a particular panelist, please mention that. Thank you. This actually involves the majority of the panel, as you all mentioned, specific components of this. One of the things that was mentioned was the business model of education. And one of the facets of the business model of education right now is we have states that are funding the education of what is the future workforce and our future adult um, population. That is, the benefit of that is for the companies that get to integrate them into their, into their productions. And yet, we don't really require or even ask oftentimes to have private or large corporations help to ed, uh, invest in education, yet you'd be very surprised how many of them are so eager to be in there. Some of the terms you've said was, you know, adaptive systems and real-time learning, and that the experts are the teachers. Oftentimes the experts are, are actually engaged and are members of different types of um, uh, organizations and, and businesses. So there, there is a business model, however, because you'd be so surprised how eager they are to get in there. An example is, uh, I, I, not to, a shameless plug, but Warner Brothers and Microsoft, they're putting on this huge free event at NERD for all the higher education in the greater Boston area three weeks from now at, uh, at, on February 20th. And other businesses have jumped at the chance to get their people inside the classrooms to be teaching alongside teachers to provide all those things that you said, dominant experts teaching, content meeting systems, adaptive systems in real time. When do you think we will start to look at the private organizations or actual companies, if you will, and ask them to start to invest more or at least showcase you know, the benefits because they get top talent, they get to show them the current practices, the best practices of the industry, that they're, jump, they're jumping at it. But when do you think the greater, or the greater environment is gonna say, yeah, we really need organizations to be a part of education because it's on our back to fund it, and yet they're the ones that benefit off would like to take that? Uh, uh, let me uh, jump in real quickly. Um, uh, great question. You should probably be down in Washington helping to set policy. Um, the, the, the broad issue that you talk about is who's funding education and, uh, and what's the role of kind of general taxpayer dollars versus corporations. I think there's some societal breakdown when you look at the fact that corporate profits are the greatest part of GDP and we're suffering in terms of um, um, expenditures at the federal and state level around education and the beneficiaries of the education system are the companies that's called free rider. Maybe they're part of the 47%. So that's why I think you should go down to Washington. In terms of practically how that's happening, the two examples, 10 seconds. One is Udacity, what they're doing in, in trying to vertically integrate with corporations to get talent trained through their MOOCs and, and sourced through their MOOCs, which I think is a very disruptive and clever move. And then I think you see these kind of code academies and code schools, which companies are ginning up. It's kind of the, the you know, tech test on steroids. Um, tech test meets, meets you know, um, case interview process and, uh, you know, meets, meets class. And uh, companies have been innovating in that, say in New York and some up here, and I've seen some companies actually going to third parties and saying, we will help you source talent um, through code academies. So that's a, these are some uh, entrepreneurial ways of making that shift. I think there's a bigger, broader policy question you raise though. There's a very good um, and interesting example in Brazil 
where industry is very closely aligned with higher education and so aligned over time that in fact there are exit exams in higher education for in Brazil where you cannot exit without meeting some standard and those standards are in large part driven by the collaboration between the educational unit and an industry. Now in Brazil, the educational system is 75% uh, private, so, so it's a little bit different. But even in Europe and in Japan and Korea specifically, you're seeing this tie between demand in industry influencing the Minister of Education and the output. And I, I think that's really where we have room to, to, to grow is let's produce a better product and, and let industry tell us what that better product should be. I was in a conference here at MIT itself where it was on advanced manufacturing and there were uh, panelists from Raytheon and uh, you name it, the largest companies, defense and non-defense, and they represented $50 billion of companies and they were all saying they cannot find trained people to, for their jobs. So I think there's absolutely the skill gap where I think the places like MOOC can really help to bridge that uh, gap. So I think on one end we are saying we have very high uh, unemployment rate. There are people sitting trying to get the employment and there are people, employers, who say we cannot find the people. And we're talking about the first world, United States of America. What's wrong with that situation? I think this, your point is well taken. I think industry need to now participate in these experiments and put some dollars so that they can benefit from the skills gap. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions, but I'm sure the panelists will be more than happy over the next uh, day and a half to take uh, any questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, Ariel, Bill, Dan, Nish, thank you very much. Appreciate all